Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that we've been lucky enough to implement here for over two years now. The product in and of itself is exactly what you need it to be, guys, with options ranging from being a workout provider, as in sending the workout directly to the student athlete's phones, to being a place where you can communicate with them and bring together multiple streams of data to be its own dashboard for you, your coaching staff, or the athletes. Or you can use what we've added to our, our menu of Coach Me Plus activities, and that's the Hydration Station, where all of this information that is provided is based off of research from the Corey Stringer Institute, where we're looking at weighing in versus weighing out and then providing optimal hydration uh, strategies for the student athletes by them selecting through the menu and tapping on what they'll take home with them and what they're consuming prior to the next practice um, when all the numbers at the top are lined up green. It's something we've had really good success with and the kids have really bought in on. Just another great example of the awesome product that you can find at coachmeplus.com. Guys, hop over to coachmeplus.com today and check it out. It's a product I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down and talking training with Matt Wenning. Matt's going to start out giving us a little background and then dives right into it. Matt breaks down the issues that he sees with the training world today. He touches upon the complexity of training, rushing results, and what those issues can lead to. And then he gets into how he plans training and the things that he looks at. Absolutely fascinating to hear one of the strongest people in the history of the world breaking down how they program, not just for themselves, but for the vast array of athletes that Matt works with. He then gets into what he thinks of the role when it uh, comes to specialized or specific exercises for sport and or life and where he's starting to see the problem when it comes to the general population carrying into both tactical athletes and team sport athletes and why training is changing because of that. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. All right, and here we go. Matt, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Yeah, no problem, buddy. Hey, so listen, for the for the one person who may not know who Matt Wenning is, uh, let, let's give them the quick Cliff Notes version of, of where you are and what you're doing, and we'll get rocking and rolling. All right, well, I own a performance center up in Columbus, Ohio, where we do private uh, strength conditioning training for all types of people, but mostly police, fire, and military personnel. Um, I am a strength and wellness coordinator for upwards of five fire departments, um, taking care of all of their strength conditioning needs, nutrition needs, getting their body fat down, getting their blood work to to look better in their physicals, keeping the aging process down with that, and then do contracting work with the military. Um, And I've worked with 82nd Airborne, 3rd Battalion Rangers, and, and 4th Infantry units as their strength conditioning um, coordinators and advisors. 
Fantastic. And you've, you've also had a little bit of experience when it comes to lifting weights as well. Yeah. So, um, I started training when I was 13. I did my first bench meet when I was 13 and a half or 14 years old. Um, I broke my first world record at 28 and broke my second world record at 33 and then broke my third world record at 35. Um, I broke world records both in equipped lifting with uh, suits and knee wraps and that such and completely raw. So I'm one of the few lifters in the world that has done both, um, I guess you can call them completely different sports um, of powerlifting um, and, and done them at a world class level and been at the top at least three to five person in the world for the last 15 years. So uh, injury rates have been super low. Um, experience has been very, very high. I've trained at um, the top gyms in the world, um, Westside Barbell. I trained at Lexington with Chuck when we moved there from Westside and started my own performance center where we have four to six guys at any one time that can deadlift over 700 and bench over 500. And this is just guys that have normal jobs and aren't really powerlifters. They just want to train hard. So, um, you know, I've been around the game a long time. I've been around a lot of the innovators of the sport. That's awesome. So now being around the game and, and being around the people who have made it what it is and, and the rock stars that we all know, what are some things that you're seeing right now when it comes to, to training that, that we need to kind of get a grip on here? Well, I think the one big thing is that everybody thinks training is simple and it's actually not. If, um, if you look at the entire world as a whole, the human body is one of the most complex things to understand, especially as it involves accommodating and training. So when I look at a training program that's too simple, then it usually means that it's too simple and it's not going to work effectively. Um, the next big thing is, is usually if somebody asks me to look at a program do an assessment on what they're doing, and I know, and I notice that they don't have anything plugged in based on their weaknesses or recovery uh, modalities. Then I automatically turn it down or tell them that they might need to look elsewhere. So, um, you know, my saying, which I've been fairly famous for saying a lot for the past ten years, is, you know, it's not what you can do; it's what you can recover from, and you're better off saving a little bit in the tank every workout and making sure that you can do it again in three days versus trying to kill yourself to the point you have to take two weeks off because you pulled a muscle or you overtrained. But I think that people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and underestimate what they can accomplish in five. So people will try to say, well, I want to get my squat up to 600, right? And then they're only at 485 versus saying, I think I want to get my squat to 700 in five years which would be actually easier than moving a whole hundred pounds in one year, depending on where you're at. But the point is that I think we all tend to overestimate what we can get done in 12 months, but underestimate what we can get done in five years. And I actually, the first time I heard that was from Charles Pollock when me and him are pretty good friends. And he said that at one seminar and it really stuck with me very, very hard. You know, I, I wasn't one of the guys that came into the strength game and had all the genetics in the world, like a Bill Kazmaier or a Zadrinus Savickas or a, Brian Shaw, I was, you know, I would consider myself middle to bottom of the barrel as far as genetics go um, and things like that. So I had to work really hard and have long term planning involved to break world records. I couldn't just show up and be the man on the scene. Um, so, you know, it took me quite a few years to be world class. And to do that made me realize that, you know, this sport is a long term endeavor and you have to be willing to not only learn how to turn the throttle upward, but actually back the throttle down and learn how to recover. No, I love that. Now let's, let's fast forward now to where you're at with, you know, the, the tactical athletes and how you would look at that with team sport athletes, because I think that that's that whole idea of saving for tomorrow is, is one that, that we definitely share. But I also think it's one that might be overlooked and almost bastardized by some coaches. Yeah. Well, let me see if I think what you're saying or asking, let me think if I'm thinking about this correctly. So I look at athletes and tactical people exactly the same because my philosophy on training is based on people's weak points. So I think sports specificity needs to be a lot further down the, the checklist than actually making sure that the individual gets what they want. So when I train my tactical clients, I don't get to choose how, you know, if you work with college, then your age is going to be pretty much dictated to you because it's going to be between 18 and 22. 
If you work with high school, it's going to be between 14 and 18. The point is, is that my tactical officers and personnel can be anywhere from 22 years old all the way up to 55, 60. So the, the idea is, is that obviously you can train harder when you're younger, but the philosophy is the same, which is where are you weak and how do we fix these areas so that you're less prone to injury so that we can train harder. Um, so does that kind of answer what you were asking? Yeah, a hundred percent. So then how then do you dictate that with the men and women that you're working with? Okay. Well, that's pretty simple. So the first thing that you would do, if I were a strength coach at a college pro team or high school, the first thing I would do is get the last five year injury rates. So I would see how many ACL issues do we have? How many lower back issues do we have? How many shoulder issues do we have? Now, the younger the sport, the amount of data you're going to collect from that is marginal. But if you're at a fire department where the average age is 45 years old, you're going to have a pretty big collection of data of where guys are hurt. So in the tactical world, which is not much different than the sporting world, the three major injury areas are knees, lower back, and shoulder. So what you start to do is you start to create a plan based on the specificity of the injuries. So what I realize is that the knee problems are usually coming from a hamstring dis discrepancy. The lower back problems coming from a lack of glute activation and the shoulder problems are coming from lack of posture or scapular muscle hypertrophy or functionality. So the, that's my first step is I look at the injury rates. That's exactly what I did with, uh, third battalion rangers which was my first uh, special forces army group unit that i work with is i wanted to see the injuries so that way i knew what was the problem was instead of coming in and just saying well you know these guys are weak and we're just going to do a generalized training program which a lot of people do instead go and find what they need so that your guide uh, of training them is much more specific to the actual injury result in the individual's problems versus just some you know, arbitrary system that has come up. So I have ideas on the way I want to train someone, but the ideas can drastically change based on what I see in the injury rates and the individual need. No, I love that. So then moving forward and kind of taking that as Matt now versus Matt back when he was setting world records as a lifter, how, yeah. would, how would that have helped you? Well, I think I got lucky that I was around a lot of smart guys when I was younger. So my philosophy has stayed pretty much the same, I would say, since I've been world class. So the way I would train um, at 26 to 28 versus now 38 is pretty much the same. It changes anywhere from 2 to 5% a year, uh, warm-ups, how I attack the main work, what I do for max effort work, um, those types of things. But the, the generalized system has stayed – pretty much the same for the last 15, almost 20 years. So I've said, I would say I've been training very similar since I was about 18 to 20. Um, so I think the things that I've learned, uh, um, is just having a, a better coach's eye now. So like if you were to come to me and, and do a squat or a deadlift or a bench, I could pick up the small subtleties that back in the day, I would have only been able to pick up the big problems. But now I think, the better a coach you are, you can see the smaller issues. Mm -hmm. So if you were to come and watch me squat, you probably wouldn't see a whole lot of form issue, but there's still a small problem, a minute problem there that you may not be able to see directly. You might be looking in the wrong spot. Whereas I think a lot of college and high school coaches, I believe, miss, miss that style of coaching eye or don't have it because they don't know what it feels like to be insanely strong. So they don't know the small steps in which it takes to get that good to where these small little details become very, very important down the road. So, for instance, like I have a guy named Rob I've trained for six years now, and he got to a 700-pound deadlift twice as fast as I did because I could see him starting to overtrain. Then I could see him not having the right muscle group, so we would back off and fix those problems before I kept pushing the weights upward. So he never ended up with a, with a technical issue and he never had a muscle weakness. Whereas when I was 18, 19, I probably could have thought about it, but I wouldn't have known how to attack it. And I think the only way you do that is by pushing your own limits and being around, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people that you have to fix very quickly because you don't have time, i.e. like the military. So when I was working at fourth infantry, 
we had to get those guys to be very proficient deadlifters, and I was in charge of 6,500 soldiers. So you could imagine the amount of stress and taxing that would be to do that. So that means your coaching has to be very clear and direct, and you have to not waste a lot of time because you have a new group coming in of massive amounts. So um, that's kind of what I've learned along the way, I guess, in my 30s, based more so than in my 20s. My 20s, I was more focused on me being strong. And then my 30s, by teaching others, I learned a lot more about not only myself, but the people I work with. I love it. And now let's go back to the programming and how you're setting this up. Because I think that one thing that people still have a hard time with is understanding how the selection of max effort exercises, whether they're special strength or, or just simple evaluatory tools, um, yeah. is put together. How do you break that yeah. down? And then how do you carry that into your accessory work? Well, my system is a little bit different than what like Louie and those guys write about. So, so I use a linear periodization conjugate hybrid is what I call it. And basically what that means is that I will use a direct weight and a straight bar competition stance, competition style. And I will do that anywhere in the off season, every five weeks to end season, every three. Now, Based on what I feel and what I see in the videos of me taping those straight bar squats, I start looking at small little increments of muscle groups that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So if I sense that my upper back needs to be stronger to squat a heavier weight three weeks from that point, I put in a safety bar because now it's going to tax my upper back. If I sense that my core is not very strong, I put in a camber bar. If I sense that my middle or top range is weak or is not experiencing as much acceleration as I would like, I put in the chains or the bands. If I feel like my bottom end strength is weak, then I put in a lot of boxes that are slightly lower than where I squat. The point is, is that there is variation, but there's specificity to variation based on what I feel and what I see. So I squat with a straight weight, say 75% for five. And then those two weeks in between the next uh, free bar squat, I pick exercises that I feel are, are um, slightly correcting my weaknesses and making those muscles activate or potentiate into the movement. Then what I do is I'll ramp the next straight bar squat up the third week and do, say, 80% for four. Then two weeks in between that, I'll analyze that squat, and then I'll base what I do on those next two weeks based on what I saw on the 80, 80%. Then I work it way up and then up, and if you go into a 12-week cycle – or so you've squatted with a straight bar every four weeks, but in between you have utilized a mix and match process based on what you feel and what you see. So it's a lot more involved than just variation. It has purpose based on what you need at that time. And the problem is I think what really makes it complicated is not knowing all the exercises is understanding that you're not going to step in the same pond twice. So the, the peaking cycle that I used to squat 832 world record did not get me to get up to 865. It had to be 5 or 10% different because I was one year older and I had one year more mileage on me. So to go from 832 to 865 was actually more recovery than it was training hard because my body was getting older and I had to train smarter. So I started the percentages lower and I changed around some of the exercises. The point is, is that you're chronologically aging as you train, and your training age is getting older. Those are the few things that are really causing the big issues. Does that make sense? Oh, 100%. So you have to understand all the exercises and what they're good for, and then you also have to understand where you're at in your chronological age and where you're at in your training age. If you can understand those three things, conjugate training is not hard, but conjugate training is a thought, a thinking man's process. Now, how you do that with a team is you got to pick the lesser of both evils or however you want to look at it. Basically, you look at the team as a whole and go, okay, I know as a whole this team has shitty hamstrings. I know as a whole this team has terrible lower backs based on the technique I saw as an entire team on squatting or deadlifting or whatever. And then what you do is you base your programming based on the average amount of people that where they're weak. So – when I go into the Army now, I base everything on knee injuries, lower back injuries, and shoulder injuries. If I go into a team, I might do a technical max on a couple of lifts, and I will base what I see and what muscle groups aren't firing, and that's going to decide the program for the team. 
because in reality, we don't have any athlete in any of our gyms or pro teams that have strong enough rear delts, strong enough hamstrings, active enough glutes, strong enough lower backs or core or however you want to say it now. Um, all those things are huge issues in every sport. Once you develop those areas and get them up to par, you're going to see performance increases on the field. But I think the biggest problem is, is like we don't do a whole lot of specific tactical drills other than I make them do cardio in their full equipment. Like with my firemen, they got to get in bottles and all their breathing apparatuses and all their fire retardant gear. And they have to do some of their cardio in that. So they're used to it. But in reality, getting them just basically stronger makes them so much better as a fireman that it's it's unbelievable. But I think the problem is, is that we don't look at training as a whole coaching wise as a big pyramid scheme i.e. we have to have a big base to have a big peak. So if, if, you, if you're out doing fireman-specific drills and your guys can't deadlift 200 pounds, you're wasting your time. you got to get the deadlift up around two times body weight before specific drills or even be able to be done hard enough to have any transfer to the real world. Because the big problem with the fire departments now is not fire. It's carrying heavy people to the hospital and getting them out of their house. You know, the average age is much higher in the U.S. now than it was 25 years ago. I think the average age is close to 50, maybe 55. And the amount of people that are diabetic and overweight is insane right now. So where our firemen are getting hurt is carrying these people downstairs, getting them into the medics, taking them to the hospital. Um, and, and the ones that we're doing that to are the ones that are taking most of the runs because, you know, a 450 pound diabetic person is not going to go to the hospital once a year. They're going to go to the hospital every other month. That's what we're starting to see now is our ultra obese patients are constantly going to the hospital and you're sending four guys in to pick up a 500 pound guy. That's, that's a high risk of danger, not only because it's awkward, but because it's an odd, it's, it's, you know, you're doing it up and down stairs and you're, you're doing it around heavy equipment. So the point is, is that you got to build a baseline of strength. You got to build a baseline of conditioning before you can even consider specific motives to get better. No, and I, I couldn't agree more with that. And those numbers are actually frightening. Yeah, uh, I mean, just in Dublin, I don't, you, know, you know Columbus, Ohio very well? Uh, I've been there a few times. Okay, well, Dublin is the very ritzy area. The first fire department I ever got was Dublin because they were the ones that were able to afford it. And we have t over 20 people now in Dublin that weigh over 450 pounds. And this is the most affluent area in all of Ohio almost. It's where they play Murfield golf. You're talking, these aren't, these aren't broke people with in low income housing. These are people that you would think are college educated would know better. And we have that many people over 450 pounds. So imagine what it's like in central Ohio, downtown Columbus, the bad side of town. Get my point. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with people that are very overweight and very dangerous to move just because you're dealing with, I mean, in all reality, most firemen are average or below average strength level of the average male. So you send four below average guys that can't deal with 200 pounds to pick up a 450 pound person and carry him downstairs. You're in a big problem. Make sense? Oh, a hundred percent. So what's making strength conditioning be huge now with fire services, the average population weight is going up and it's the same problem in the military. I saw data from 1962 or 64 that the average person that went into the army weighed 165 pounds and the average body fat was 15%. That's pretty lean because mm -hmm. most of the kids came from farm, right? They came from the farm. They had manual labor jobs since they were 10 years old and were old enough to work on a farm and help their parents. You know what the average weight is now that's going in the army and body fat percentage? It's 195 to 200 and the average body fat's 26. So they're 30 pounds heavier, but they're 50 pounds more body fat. That's not a good thing. Well, no, but that now you know why everybody's getting hurt doing basic training and why they have to modify basic training. They have to modify all these things for people to even get in the Army anymore because the test that they used in 64, 62, people can't pass because they're, they're uber more body fat and they're way more. So imagine taking a – you took a kid that never ran and worked on a farm and weighed 165 and 15% body fat and you go run the shit out of them every day, probably not going to hurt them. They're going to be tired and sore, but they're going to be able to withstand it because they're fairly athletic coming in. Take the same person, add 10% body fat, and go run them and do high-impact drills. 
what are you going to have? Lower back, knee, shoulder problems, right? Because you're going to make them do push-ups until they puke and get all their bad weight off. Instead, I think we almost, in the Army now, we almost need to have an eight-week pre-boot camp where everybody eats right, loses the body fat, and gets conditioned to even be able to do basic training anymore. And as you know, as a coach, how many, how many college athletes have you gotten or seen in the last 20 years and the fitness level just gets worse and worse because they don't even have gym classes anymore? Oh, you ain't kidding. Yeah, so this is a big problem. But that's what we're dealing with now, and that's why strength conditioning is becoming such a huge proponent is because you know the average kid in the 60s was carrying gallons of rocks you know on the farm and moving hay bales all day so you take them in and over them it's not that big of a deal but you take an average person that's just played video games and never had a gym class you got a big problem yeah and it doesn't help either that a lot of these kids in these situations whether it be college or the military are given things that they need to pass and are given programs to to at least partially prepare them for what they're getting into and they just yep. blow them off too yep they do it's it's a work ethic issue too you know oh yes yeah that's that's the big issue for sure so then matt where do you see all this going like where the future of all this i mean you've 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 seen powerlifting grow into what it is you've you've yeah. been on the inside as a lifter and and as a coach you've you've now seen training in the grandest scheme possible, looking at the, the United States military and the firefighters and, and the athletes that you work with, what, where do you see this going? Well, I think in the fire department and Army, I think it's getting too expensive to take care of guys that don't want to stay in shape. So I think eventually what's going to end up happening is if you don't want to, per, if you don't want to perform in a wellness program, you don't want to stay in shape and you want to smoke or chew tobacco, then you're not going to be insured. That's where I think it's going to end up happening. But it's not probably going to be in our lifetime, but it's coming. So at my fire department, pre or post 2011, if you don't pass, let me let me get this. Let me give you this example. If you got hired before 2011 up at Dublin uh, Fire Department, you took the wellness test or the physical agility test. And if you passed it, you got an extra one thousand dollars on top of your salary. OK, now after 2011, if you don't pass it, they can fire you. So it used to be, yeah, it used to be where you had it and it was a bonus. Now it's a requirement. You see, so what's happening is the guys that are staying out of shape, they're, they're starting to slowly or and aggressively wean on the insurance companies to the point that they can't be insured because they're too expensive. Make sense. Mm -hmm. So the expense of the medical side of it's going to cause strength conditioning to have more of an impact because now Companies and colleges want to see savings of money. So that's where I see you see the big issue, I think. Um, how that plays down in athletics is still uncertain, but it's still the same thing. You know, if you do a good job and you keep players from having ACL tear outs and blowouts and having to actually quit playing sports, I mean, how does that work? When you have a four year scholarship promise and you blow your knee out your sophomore year, do you still get your scholarship if you did it on the field? You do, don't you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, how, how much money did that cost the university? See what I mean? 100%. So our job is very, very important, and the importance keeps rising because we keep getting more out of shape. So it's hard to say where it all goes, but in my opinion, I think, um, you know, as much as I really don't like CrossFit, it's helped the community have a better impact on females. You know, females want to look more muscular now. They want to lift weights now. Which, when I was a kid, if you were a weightlifter and a girl, you were a weirdo, you know. And I'm not that old, but I remember at 18, 19 years old, there were no females other than a few that came from Indiana that I saw that were good lifters that people were like, oh, wow, you lift weights? You look really good. I want to look like you. Now that's everywhere, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I think CrossFit's had some good impact on people. I think just the advent of ridiculous training has made it even worse, but – at least the the physical view of what people want to look like has gotten more muscular, which is good. Um, so that helps the general population, I think. A hundred percent, yes. And you know, it's it's that's a great point that you bring up, and I think that that's really interesting how they're handling the firefighters with, you know, basically it's you're fit or you're out. You know, there's there's some people in the in the NFL that they've treated like that too that had to make weight in certain aspects. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you're talking because they're spending millions and millions of dollars on these players. Well, now insurance costs are so expensive, they're spending millions and millions of dollars on insurance costs with these firemen. So it doesn't pay for a company to hire a guy that's not going to be fit, not work out, and get injured all the time. You know, they just can't afford it. It's kind of what happened with General Motors. You know, my both of my grandfathers retired from General Motors 35 plus years in the thing, and you should see their retirement. They have full insurance until they die. They get massive insurance pensions, and half the people they work with wouldn't even show up to work half the time. And that's and you know, they be they get called off on a bogus back injury or a shoulder problem and then they go on disability and they get 60 70 percent of their paycheck until they die well how long does that last well we found out didn't we general motors closed all their doors and moved their shit to mexico and that's why so a lot of my uncles are very upset with a lot of the guys or grandfathers are very upset with the guys that they retired with because a lot of them use the system and i think that's what you see in the fire service it's what you see in the police you see guys get on and they're in shape and even in the fbi they actually just started a uh, wellness program or strength conditioning fitness program in the in the FBI. It used to be the FBI was very hard to get into physically taxing, but once you got in, there was no physical standard to maintain. So the FBI guys started getting fatter and fatter and fatter to the point that they started making them have to work out now because the initial process of getting in was hard, but then after that, guys started getting more out of shape. So now it's costing the FBI a ton of money. So that's the thing. I think it's going to end up, you know, with people that are, and I hate to say it, but people that are average almost have to be forced into fitness because they're going to take the easy route. They think it's more work for them. You know, I'm not getting paid anymore and I got to go work out. Well, yeah, but what you don't understand is your retirement's going to be way better because you can still walk and move and you still have health. But people don't realize the quality and the, um, the advantage of being healthy until it's too late. You ever notice the people that finally get a heart attack or they finally have to have a knee replacement because they didn't want to work out. And now all of a sudden their physical therapy is like a hundred miles an hour because now they see the, they see the danger at the end of the tunnel, but it's too late versus if they would have had that work ethic when they were 25 and did something for their body every day, whether it's walk or lift or whatever, if they'd have done something, for 15 to 30 minutes every day of their life, they wouldn't be in this predicament. And now they wouldn't be going through all these surgeries and have these health issues. So I, I don't know. I, I think it's a huge problem across the world, but definitely in the United States. I mean, we got to get our shit together for sure. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that the part that's scary is that people still wouldn't care if it didn't cost them so much money. Exactly. And that's, the, that's what's really sad is it's really – becoming an issue now because it's costing money, not because it's better for everybody. Yeah, no, 100%. But Matt, this is absolutely fantastic. Where can people find more about you? Where can they see you on the social outlets so they can keep up with everything that Matt Winning's doing? Well, I'm on Instagram at Real Matt Winning, uh, just like it's spelled. And then uh, my website is winningstrength.com. So we do online programming there for individual, for everyone. Um, we do checkups weekly on that. You can see my equipment lineup, which my belt squat's been a huge hit. We're now in two NFL teams, multiple colleges and big high schools, and a lot of pro performance gyms uh, with the belt squat machine and a couple other pieces. Um, I'm trying to think what else we got on there. Obviously, we're doing seminars all the time. We have a squat seminar coming up January 13th, um, and that's going to be a whole afternoon. We only let a limited amount of people in to make sure they're perfected before they leave. And understand where their weaknesses are and how to do that. So we got our hands in a lot of things right now, uh, but that's the best way. And then obviously I'm on Facebook. My private page is full, but my community page is still hopping. So you can get on there and dig through that and ask questions. But on Instagram and Facebook, I post a lot of what I do. Um, so if people are very, very uh, keen on seeing new exercises and what to what they can do with the equipment, it's, it's very nice for them to get on Instagram and just kind of sift through it and look through all the different modifications we've made with normal training. Awesome. Yes. Love it. And we will have all that in the notes, folks. Check it out. Follow him because uh, Matt's always putting awesome stuff out on the gram. It's, it's great. So, Matt, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today, man. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so Not much for your time. Not a problem at all. Thanks for listening. Yeah, man. And we'll be in touch real soon. Okay, buddy. Thanks. And a huge thank you to Matt Wenning for sitting down and being so open, honest, and candid with us today. Guys, just some fantastic stuff. 
And Matt is putting out killer stuff on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Make sure you're following him at the Real Matt Wenning on Twitter and Instagram, and follow his fan page, Real Matt Wenning on Facebook. And guys, if you're interested in that squat uh, clinic, make sure you check that out at his page, WenningStrike.com. As always, all that is in the the notes. So make sure and you follow him and you check that out. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. And guys, if there's anybody that you know that could use this talk and the information it provided, please tweet it at them. Tag them in the posts, whatever it may be. Just trying to get all the great information out there that we can to all the fantastic coaches associated with Central Virginia Sport Performance. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.